What's going on? This is JP from the Heads Up Podcast. We're just here at Pace of Play, our indoor facility in Toronto. I'm here with my boy Josh. All right, just wanted to set the table for this particular episode. So we actually broke this out into a two-parter. We had our first cut where we talked about kind of who we are, a bit about opening up an indoor golf facility, and then we went deeper into it in the second episode. Even if it's just one person that, that hears this and gets inspired to start their own business, you know, we'd be happy for all the work that we put into this episode. So uh, thanks for watching episode five. Let's get right into it. Here's part one. Let's go. <laughs> cool, man. You know, everyone that I talk to that comes here loves the vibe, you know, yeah. like whether they're sitting on like a, you know, a comfy couch or they're like loving the music. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. So speaking of like startups. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's get right into it. Yeah. yeah. And all like, ooh, like what's going on? Like, where do you guys like, you know, come from in terms of like work and background and yeah, kind of all that jazz. I've always had a job, I guess, but uh, always was entrepreneurial just did some side projects that did okay but didn't really take off so sure. what were those like small projects that kind of led you here you know so I, like i can i came from the tech industry so mm-hmm. like yeah tech so i worked for a company that built mobile apps from scratch yeah. so there's like some games we built I, I built i created like a publication for like mobile gaming and stuff like that but that's what that's kind of what led me to this was like i realized like i hate playing mobile <laughs> games like they're not even fun like i i thought Mobile games is going to kind of take over a console. Yeah. The way they're talking about mm-hmm. the new devices. But yeah. a lot of learnings from that that actually translated into, into golf hats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tech, man. Tech is such a huge world. It, you know what I mean? Like, especially right now. Especially with, like, AI coming out and, yeah, you know, yeah. it's developing on, a, on, like, a crazy rate. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I'll, I'll say, like, working for a startup, you could see from the beginning just an idea come to life. And you just got just gotta have the right people and smart people to build it out. And yeah. I think that was limiting for me because I'm, I'm not a coder or anything like that. But I had a lot of ideas. Yeah, yeah. Something like this was actually something that we could do ourselves, right? Sick. Yeah, like good segue to Ash. Yeah, I'm actually curious to like how you guys, you know, yeah, <laughs> met. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, how did that start? It's a crazy story, actually. Like when I think back on it and reflect back on it as a business we've done a lot in the last 12 15 months like in fairly short order yeah but we went to high school together you know we go to our own universities lose connection as as things happen right as Life friends problems. go yeah and then over the pandemic we you know i kept seeing this golf heads account that i had been following i'd gotten really into the hype culture and like i love golf so kind of all came together I was following this golf heads account and I kept seeing JP Kim, first person to like every post. Yeah, yeah. And I'm a marketing guy. Yeah. I'm like, either Jay's running this account or he's associated with this account. He knows the team somehow. I didn't know what it's a huge account, so I didn't know what was behind it. Yeah. And so what they I, I Hold on. Yeah. yeah. Stuff, yeah. So at that time, yeah. Like, can you remember um how many followers or how big this account was? Ooh, good question. I I can't remember. I know it was it was six figures, so it was like, yeah. I don't know if you had hit two yet or just before two. Like it was in that range, Got but it. yeah, it, it, like fully established. Like, a, like you know, I was a fan first, which is yeah. really cool. And then one day, I still have the screenshot. I just texted <laughs> JP question mark, and Jay wrote Ash question mark, yeah. and and that was it. That was over Instagram, kind of middle of the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like 2019 ish. Yeah, maybe even later, right? Like two, 2021. Yeah. 2020, maybe we reconnected. You know, a bit of my background, like I'm similarly like share that entrepreneurial kind of spirit, that sure. background. I was playing a lot of these indoor simulators once, you know, we were locked down here in Toronto, like everything was shut down. These sims were kind of hovering in a gray area where we were able to get out, socialize, still be, you know, involved with the game. During the winter, during those months was like, for me personally, it was huge, like being able to be out there and like, you know, whereas everything else was so shut down. Shut down. Yeah. Um, I just left the city to move out to the burbs. Like it was a pretty big adjustment during that period. So like yeah. golf was something I really fell back into. Um, and my brain, call it a little bit of arrogance, knowing that like I had reconnected with Jay, we had this amazing like online community. I was like, I keep paying for these Sims and like we're going to these Sims every week. 
I can never get a bay when I need it. Yeah. I only want to play track man, but I can never get a freaking track man bay anywhere. Yeah. And we had this, it was like this recurring thing and we were finally like, why don't we just do this ourselves? And again, I think it's a little bit of irrational confidence that comes with having like built some businesses before. I'd built a couple of retail facilities before, so I wasn't worried about, I don't know, we went, we went with very little fear. It was exactly what Jay said earlier is that we, I think we complimented each other at the perfect time. Yeah. And some of these things are serendipitous, right? The way it works out, we reconnected through an Instagram account to think that like through your fucking IG. Yeah. We're now sitting here having this conversation. Yeah. like so. pretty unreal, right? Like yeah. when, like the odds of this happening are very low. Yeah. Um, and I'm proud to say we're fucking successful at it too. Like, so like, you know, I think that's part that's helped reinforce how we're, we had the right idea. And for once I like, I believe in our execution. Cause like, like you said, like we've got some really good positive feedback from people in our community and it all stemmed from like, yeah, a conversation on IG, yeah. some irrational confidence <laughs> and a little bit of background as, as hustlers and entrepreneurs. But yeah, speaking of uh, serendipity, you know, like this was this relationship three of us that we've sort of created was serendipitous yeah you know like i come here all the time you know and i was like i love it here this is one of my favorite places i was so curious to who ran it you know and i'm like who the fuck are these guys you know and and i just started to reach out to my network to see you know who who knows you guys who else comes here um and do you know uh mark mendani yeah 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 yeah, yeah. how do you know uh, we did, uh, we, we were doing some stuff with Kenneth and he, we were in like a, we did like a photo shoot. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this guy's a low key model. Eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mark's a model. Yeah. He's like yeah. a six foot something bearded dude. Bearded. Yeah. In shape. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not gonna lie. Um, but that's, that's who I reached out to and he was like, yo, yeah. Um, I know John. Yeah. Um, and then. I don't know how I got a hold of you. I think it was IG. Yeah. I, I was actually following you at the time. I, I saw one of your golf video. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't know how it came up in my feet, but I'm a creeper too on Instagram. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but then I saw it and then I recognized uh, Nico's uh, uncle. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, these guys are all connected. So I had an idea. Like, True. But yeah, then I just started following. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy how it, it all like the stars aligned, you yeah. know, and I feel like there's a reason why it did because we're all so passionate about you know golf yeah it all comes full circle we're all golfers we love golf yeah um and oh, i've never asked you what how'd you fall in love with the game like where where's your your love for for golf come from dude i'm just i feel like i'm just so competitive yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. You know? um and golf is now just has has my attention yeah uh since covid you know a lot of my family started to play yeah. when covid hit um, which just, it just like drove my desire to get out more with them. Um, and then it just grew from there, you know, and, um, I, I can't wait to play you guys. Yeah. I actually, yeah. I've, I've, <laughs> see, I've seen him swing. He's got a nice swing. Yeah. <laughs> actually, I haven't seen him on, uh, like on a golf course. Yeah. All no. it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was actually here. I don't know when it was. It was a Sunday night. I remember cause I was, I was going to a game, a hockey game, but then Ash came through like, Again, serendipitous. Um, and he's like, yo, you want to play quick nine? I'm like, talk. I'm like, all right. <laughs> I was like planning, like, oh, I don't want to play with these guys yet until we get on the course. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and then this guy whooped my ass. And I was like, minus, he was like, oh, yeah, three under. And I was like, plus six. But we're, track, we're experienced yeah. with the sim. Yeah, yeah, we know the sim. So we know the sim well. Side, yeah. In what way? But yeah, yeah. Well, uh, okay, so like, yeah. For me, the real fundamental piece is that here in the sim, you always have the perfect lie. That can also be a negative because, like, grounding out a club into concrete is not fun. <laughs> and for me, like, honestly, my game, since we opened up pace, my game, my, my handicap has gone down substantially. Yeah. And that's purely from the reps that I get here. Yeah. Right? So some of it translates, I think, the reps, your your technique, your swing style, all, a lot of those things can come out. The problem is you put a real ball on a real tee <laughs> in front of a real fucking fairway for the average weekend golfer yeah. who, who might not get out that often, right? Like we're, we're lucky we get to play quite a bit, but like that's intimidating as opposed to smashing a ball into a screen. Yeah. And so I think that 
that mental piece of it where here there's a lot of forgiveness right there's no ramifications for a poor shot really yeah, right so you might see it a bit on your scorecard but yeah. they, those mental games that come out with being stuck in the trees right when you see a real tree <laughs> it's different than seeing like you know, you know a bunch on the street yeah. exactly yeah, yeah also the bunkers like i i can't hit out of the bunkers you, like, there you go yeah here i just step up flop shot <laughs> perfect spin in the yeah, walls spin. yeah but, but i think it's powerful to know that you can pull off that shot now right whereas without some of that like there's certain flop shots and stuff that i feel pretty confident about now i don't think i had that swing in my bag prior to the work i put in at the sims then it's just more do you have the confidence out on the course to actually pull that shit off right like to actually put it into execution totally and that does that mess with you like mentally you know like obviously you're inside right obviously you're shooting into a turf and i've heard you know it's you get used to hearing the ball hit the screen oh interesting yeah you know? yeah i could but when you're not on the course you're not hearing any of that you know so it's like oh did i hit that good you know like you're waiting for that noise like it's like a dog in training you know what i'm saying like yeah like off the tee i think is the most crucial shot and and doing the reps here i saw a huge improvement like my bad shots are not as bad as they used to got it so as long as you can get it out there you're obviously not going to stick them but yeah knowing your yardages as well like all the data that it gives you like I, i'd rather be here than at a driving range yeah you hitting rocks like i feel like <laughs> yeah i went to the driving range this past summer i'm like what's the point of this like yeah like I, yeah i could see the ball flight but i don't i'm still hitting off of a, a mat so true the balls are garbage yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, you don't have any data. No data. No data. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, well, it's true. The one big thing too is like, um, like Jay said, like knowing your misses. You asked about like you know the ball, uh, like hearing the ball, for example, hit yeah. the screen. For me, it's now if I miss sh miss a shot out on the course, I can see the numbers in my head. Whoa! Like I know my spin rate was off by this much. If I if I miss a drive. I know it's because I didn't get my attack angle to that 2.5 to 3 that I really want to hit. Yeah. Like, I can I can feel it. That's amazing. Now, whether or not you're good enough to make those adjustments in game to say, like, oh, this feels off, I need to compensate. But to know that, you know, if I pull or I slice, it's because my face angle is off, is a I think that's really powerful because you can make that adjustment on, on your very next swing. Yeah. Whereas I didn't have that kind of insight or intel into, into my personal game until like really in the last year or so yeah so when you're when you're using the track man like what's the mo like what's your top three pieces of of data or analytics that you're taking home with you so like when i'm at the reins doing the shot analysis yeah i like looking at this swing pack so in and out out to in yeah, yeah yeah and then for me it's just like club head speed kind of knowing what that is mm -hmm. i guess just art the artists yeah 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 just how about you yeah uh I'd say attack angle was one of the big ones that I worked on, particularly around my drive, because uh, I was starting to hit down on the ball. Learning to hit up on the ball like significantly improved my yardage, so that's one I really keep an eye on. Yeah, Face angle's huge for me because I'm not consistent with the way I come down on the ball, especially as I try to, club speeds is my third one, and as I try to increase club speed, start to lose control of that face angle. Right. And that's where I end up doing a lot of wonky kind of stuff. So those are, those are probably my big ones. Yeah. I've always thought about, like, even just the spin rate, you know, like, how is that generated? Is it is it the speed? Is it, you know, the way I'm coming down on the ball? Um, there's so many variables that you have to take into consideration that I, I still don't even understand. You know, like, you guys, uh, you know, understand the numbers way more than I do, but I definitely want to get to that point. And the fact that when I heard him say that, you know, you don't even go to the range anymore, like, it blew my mind because that's all I want to do is go to the range. That's all I'm looking for is the feel and the look of the flight, the ball, you know. But, um, yeah, I guess there's two different sides to the story, you know. Yeah. Sometimes when you're outdoors, those swings feel better yeah. at, at times. And I think there's a big environmental piece to that. Because to your point about, like, spin rate, for example, if I get a heavy spin rate on a draw swing, I might actually get additional yardage. Right. But in... In person, that might that's gonna look a lot different than in a sim, particularly with Trackman, where if it picks up spin rate or a side spin or whatever with a miss hit or whatever, it exaggerates everything to the nth degree, right? It's so technical. Yeah. So exactly how you hit the ball is how it's portraying that to you, for sure. And so I think a lot of people actually have 
are misguided into thinking what they see out on their range, like on a the outdoor range, yeah. is more representative of a real shot. Yeah. And I'd actually argue it's the opposite. This is actually giving the most literal definition of what's happening to your swing. Interesting. And because environmentally, the way you play today at an outdoor range <laughs> looks a lot different than tomorrow. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. the wind could be off. You know, so many south wind beautiful. versus north winds, right? Like, yeah. it, it changes the big exactly. <laughs> right, yeah, that one might not help you either place, but yeah, yeah. No, I would say like the the, the best combo would be an outdoor range with a track. You know who has that? Yeah, we're uh, it's called Grand Vista, and it's where it's in Orlando where we're going. I'd actually be really curious because I've only done it once and it was more at like an event kind of thing and didn't really get a chance to try it out. Yeah, I'd really be curious to see if we see some of the similar. Some of the similar data that we look for in inside, yeah. If we would actually see that, in theory, it should all be the same. Yeah. But yeah, I haven't played as much with the outdoor track and settings as like in general. Yeah, I guess like skeptical, you know. Like, uh, there's a massive mat. Like, it's this track, man, but it's huge. It's probably the size of this screen, mm. and it's out in the driving range. And then they have a few behind you. And what they do is that they connect it uh, to your phone, and that's where you see the ball flight is is through the app interesting and then you have the numbers come through but yeah it was cool it was really cool i it makes sense i if uh if you have good weather all year round to have that set up you know what i mean but uh i will say like if you hit 10 shots and based on your feel point where it's gonna go trackman will get it nine times out of ten <laughs> really yeah it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah fairly accurate like, yeah uh even if i'm watching you hit off the tee and and it it'll start left and, yeah. and kind of cut back like if i see that the ball flight will represent that dude that just gave me an idea so like we should have a, like a little contest you know maybe you you hit the ball five times yeah and then you guess guess where, it's where you're gonna go yeah. guess your yardage guess your yeah. whatever like yeah. that'd be cool that'd be, cool. That'd be, yeah. that'd be, cool, yeah. that'd be yeah. sick um cool, cool. Yeah. Shout out Trackman. Shout out Trackman. Yeah. Trackman, we're looking Not for a sponsor. sponsor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not sponsor. Um, awesome, man. And like, uh, I mean, yeah. Feel free to like talk about whatever. I'm just gonna check the cameras. So yeah, yeah. Cool. So, boys, um, so let's dive into pace of play. Before I sort of ask any questions, why don't you guys paint a picture for the audience? How long have you been open? When did you guys open up? Um, mm -hmm. Give it to me, you know, as if I don't know the story. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we opened up November of 2022. Right. That's when we did our soft launch. Mm -hmm. But it took about almost a year to get to that point. Like we started talking about it back in January, I think, of that year. Yeah. It's a process just even thinking about, you know, what's the, what's our angle? Yeah. How did you guys find this place? Like the space and... How did it come across the, the, the table? We looked at a ton of spaces before this one, and we kind of had a general idea of the location around the GTA where we wanted to be. We wanted to be like just outside of the, the main core city, Toronto, accessible from, from everyone off the highway. Um, but we looked at, I don't know, five to ten different spots, and we actually put a offer down at a much smaller location than this. That luckily fell through, um, huh. but it was one of those things where when you go into the spot, you kind of just get that that feeling, like this is the spot. Yeah, yeah. And we've been to we went to some locations where we're like something seems off. There's not enough parking, not as accessible. And then this particular location, I wasn't even interested in to be honest, because there was one of our comp competitors down the road. Uh -huh. I just didn't want to be so close to them. But as soon as we saw it. Just the entire layout. It was just an open space. We just visualized, okay, this is the right amount of space. We can fit X amount of base here. We could do private on this side. And so we just locked it in. Yeah. We just locked it in and committed to it. So when you walked into here, was it, uh, were there any walls up? Like, paint a picture. Was it naked? Was it, yeah. was there... Yeah, so it used to be a like an appliance and furniture type store. Cool. Like a bit of a mom and pop shop, but like really established in the community, had been around for a long time. And so, I mean, there was shit on the walls. Like we're talking like they'd built like a fake roof yeah. on the side of the walls. So at one point, Jane and I are like literally ripping shingles off the wall. Oh my gosh. Um, 
We did some, honestly, in hindsight, we did some dumb stuff, like stuff that we were probably was outside of our core capabilities. <laughs> but Like what? Like, like, you know, like... Well, I mean, just in general, some of the demo stuff, like we, we probably took on a lot more than, like, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and just, again, it was part of the learning experience. And again, we were a little fear, fearless when it came to, like, we had the space. We knew what needed to be done. And so if there was a wall in our way or if there was something that was blocking us from doing what we needed to do, yeah. we went and tore it down. <laughs> uh, pretty literally. That's yeah. awesome. I mean, I don't know what they had on the walls, but these are, what, like 20-foot ceilings? They had maybe like 300 screws on the wall, on the drywall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we literally had to so go weird. up and unscrew every single <laughs> screw. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, um, So there was definitely a lot of labor, but, yeah. again, we learned a lot. Like, I learned how to put up drywall. Yeah. Uh, plumbing. Like, I had to fix these crappy-ass toilets. That yeah, were here. added an extra bathroom. Uh, yeah. yeah. We knew what the end vision was, so we just knew we had to get there, figure out how? whatever way to get there and yeah. there were a ton of roadblocks yeah yeah yeah. i mean that's part of the process yeah and i think one thing that's humbling about going through some something like this is like when there's shit that you don't know how to do it's about finding people who are better at it than you yeah. to come in and help service where you're struggling and and finding the right times to bring on those people and so i think jay and i did a really good job of pushing a lot of projects as far as we could and when it came time to bring in an expert to take it to that next step or the next level we were able to kind of do that. Nice. Uh, and us being a bit more hands-on definitely saved costs. Yeah, it gave us a learning experience that now we can take forward to lo- locations 5 through 10, you know what I mean, as, as we continue to grow. Totally. Yeah. Totally. No, that's a good point. Like, there, there were definitely a lot of people that helped us along the way. I want to shout out Brian. He definitely helped guide us and, nice. and do some of the automation that we we're looking for. Cool. And then the contractors that built out the bays, I mean, I think they did a really good job are, the, are, are those hired are those like trackman people no so those are separate yeah it, it was something that we were offered by trackman at the time it was something that they were really investing in which is having the construction side of the business as well as the hardware i see um going back to trackman like we made a conscious effort to have trackman on all bays um bigger investment up front but it was something that we felt was important for the community uh and i think it's proven that it's paid dividends by by doing that and taking that approach but they have their own in-house team. We decided to go out of house, um, mainly because of costs, right? Like, cool. company like Trackman didn't have that infrastructure built in, so they're outsourcing that piece of the business, oh, gotcha. and so they're effectively charging their mock markup. They have to make their money, and then the rest is going directly to the contractor. We decided to kind of circumvent that and work directly with the builders. Nice, um, which actually led to a bit more of an intimate relationship, allowing us to like again see a bit more behind the curtains. Nice. Um, and then just have that one to one with with a group that we could work with. Yeah. How do how do you guys like so how do you run this place? Um is there someone here 24 hours? Do you guys, you know, what's what's the system that's working for you guys? <clears throat> so yeah, we're a 24/7 facility, fully automated. So as they book online, they get access code and, and 10 minutes before they're round, they can yeah. come in and uh, go to their bay. Everything will turn on, and then it'll shut off automatically. Cool. So it is self-ran. So yeah. technically, Ash and I don't need to be here twenty-four-seven. We right. just like to be here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, we just like to. We are out. here a lot. We yeah. are here a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah just for context, uh, Pace of Play does have it's all um, it's all track man. Uh, mm-hmm. You guys have six bays, two private bays, four yeah. public bays. I guess you can call it. Um, but what made you guys decide? You know how many bays go in here why two private bays like you know give us some context i think a big part of it for me at least was just maximizing the space without feeling like we're cramping you in there so if you if you've been to our facility you'll see that like our screens are slightly wider the bays are a little bit longer there you know we kind of made everything slightly oversized yep just because again if you're if you're in this market where you're jumping from sim to sim we wanted you to have like a definitive pace of pace, pace of play experience. And so by coming here, especially if you're in the private bay, you know, our boots are 17, 18 feet wide, which is definitely bigger than industry average. You know, our members and our guests feel that when they come in here and it, it just feels bigger than what's out there. Right. And I think for us having, you know, Jay mentioned the, the high ceilings, I could think having six bays, making them feel airy. We really maximize the, the square footage. Totally. Uh, could we have fit more? Probably. Yeah. But fit more more bays? Yeah, we could have. We could have. I mean, we have these two private bays that are side by side, but we definitely could have done like three or four bays, open bays on the side. Got yeah. It. Yeah. 
I think a big part of it is catering to different types of golfers, right? We have the open bays where either you can come in with multiple groups and kind of be side by side or just come in solo, grind it out, play at a cheaper rate. But then these private bays is definitely a premium experience. You know, we on the weekends especially, we have groups of six in here, you know, hanging out for four to five hours. Yeah. Yeah, it was just kind of having both offerings and and yeah you pay a premium in the private but it's a different experience yeah like as a as a customer like i love coming to the private bay yeah uh you know it literally feels like i'm in my basement yeah you know not that i have a private sim in my basement <laughs> but you know what i mean like yeah. the privacy is there yeah and you could you have the couches you know it's a vibe so yeah. it's cool man i really like it yeah what's the size of the of the of the space it's about five thousand square feet Nice. Yeah. 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 So it's a pretty big facility. It is. Yeah. 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 Um, and like from the other spaces that you guys were looking at, were there, you know, smaller ones, bigger ones? Were there ones that were more enticing but not affordable or, you know, like I, I feel like that's such a huge commitment play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, space is the biggest thing, right? And that's what I noticed in a lot of the other Sims that were already out in the market. Right. Was that you're walking through people's bays um, oh. as you get to your bay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so it was just a really tight experience where they're just really pushing as many bays as possible. Mm -hmm. Things like that, it just takes away from the experience. Yeah. So, yeah, we really lucked out on this space. I think even moving forward, space is like a big driver of how we decide where we want to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to make a, I want to get a place even bigger than this, you know, maybe even double the size. Wow. And uh, we saw a few, too, that had a lot of potential. Mm -hmm. Nice. So, yeah, I think space is probably top three things to consider when when opening up a space. And what are the other two? So, location. You definitely want to be in the right area um, that's accessible. Third, I would say... I, I'll jump so, in. It's the people. Yeah. Cool. Like, uh, I'll be honest. Like, the part that, you know, Jay touched on this earlier. But, like, there's a lot of stuff that people don't see. That happens behind the scenes to keep this facility kind of up and running, both from like a community standpoint, like keeping people engaged and, and like the leagues that we run, the prizing that we do. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of things that other Sims in our community just don't do. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that just takes time and effort. And then having a partner that I can trust that if I'm not here on a day that will come in and make sure our facility is like top notch, clean, ready for the next customer to walk in. That's huge. Having that trust with your partner. Um, I feel like we've actually seen it in our in the sim community in the GTA. Mm -hmm. We've heard a couple of stories about sims not making it through that next level mm -hmm. because of internal conflict on how to run a business. Totally. And I think Jay and I were fortunate because we kind of went into it a little bit blind. Yeah. But we went to high school together. We have some history together. And I think it was pretty seamless. Like where I go left, Jay will go right. And that balance has like allowed us to get to this point where you need that piece and again running 5,000 square feet and you know making sure that it, no matter if it's customer coming in first thing in the morning or somebody coming in in the middle of the night that they have the same kind of golf experience mm -hmm. is pretty clutch like there, there are a lot of things to consider because uh, I mean we hear it all the time let's just open up one of these and and you know it's doable like it's definitely a risk there's lots of upfront costs involved yeah and finding the space is probably the hardest challenge I mean we would we would have like three or four more of these if we could find the space. But then again, when, when we talk about um, the things you don't see is uh, the marketing, the, the paid advertising, the um, the customer support. But I mean, I think uh, TrackMan has been a really good partner. And so they're head of product mm -hmm. from Sweden, right? Uh, from Copenhagen. Copenhagen. De Denmark, yeah. Came to our facility to visit, specifically our facility. Wow. Because we were the first fully automated all TrackMan sim in the gta nice um and i think this concept is is still fairly new checked out our facility um kind of saw what we're doing in the automated space so the, the trackman initial initially didn't have a lot of automation features a lot of the back end stuff wasn't uh quite there so they started rolling out features to improve that experience yeah um they even have their own like scheduling s system out there too cool did you guys look into any other? Yeah, we tried tech? a bunch. Uh, yeah. we, we tried all the Foresight products. Yeah. Um, tried tried uh, Unicor. There's one other one. But yeah, we tried a bunch of yeah. the, the other tech. Uh, went to a bunch of other facilities as well, both automated and manned. Right. Uh, just to get a vibe. But me personally, uh, always went back to TrackMan. Totally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As personal preference. Yeah. And then looking at like 
market wide. I still like a lot of elements of the Foresight product, um, but there was a challenge there with like you know they have those dots that you place on your clubs to get all of the ball data. Yeah. Whereas TrackMan's radar and sensors can pick up everything without all that additional stuff. Totally. So if you're a fitter, I could see why something like the quad would be more valuable or could be more valuable. But for us as a recreational commercial facility, TrackMan gave you like all that, all the data you want. But like really as a turnkey product. Yeah. Not, uh, I will say like even the user face, like it's it's so act like it's awesome. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yes. Like the Very intuitive versus like uh yeah, like a foresight. It's more like, you know, yeah. I don't know if it's pixelated or what, but yeah. It doesn't look it's, as as good as Trackman. It's funny because when I tried the Trackman at uh, another sim, I actually didn't like it. The navigation was pretty complicated. So on the shot analysis, which is like the driving range, yeah, yeah, yeah. it didn't even show your ball flight. It was just like all these data tiles. Oh, weird. Then they switched that over. So now you go into shot analysis, mm -hmm. driving range. And then since then, they, they launched another, another driving range feature. So yeah. a lot of user-friendly gameplay experiences, I think they saw a big market for it. I see. And they were able to push those out pretty pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think a lot of that got driven by, like, this stuff being used by just professionals and yeah, fitters, exactly. right? Like, yeah. and, like, people who want all that heavy tech-based data. Yeah. And they're like, okay, well, shit, we already have all that. Now, if we can improve the UI and layer that on top of it, then they have an unbeatable product, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, when you see it compared to some, like, the, we'll, we'll be nice, we'll call it the more cost-effective technology out there or yeah. hardware out there. Yeah. To me, I liken it to like seeing Nintendo 64 graphics or yeah. even like Nintendo Wii graphics yeah. and then playing PlayStation 5. Yeah. Right? Like that. You're getting a bit more of that, you know, mature graphics, more realistic, in my opinion, gameplay and all of that. Totally. Um, and to Jay's point, now they have a good balance of like now they have games on there. Yeah. They have uh, more of like a intuitive driving range. Mm -hmm. And I think all of that stems from places like us, like Pace that are servicing more of that retail uh, kind of direct consumer audience. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, Foresight and TrackMan are neck and neck. I think totally. their accuracy is pretty, pretty Similar. up there, but yeah. they're at the top, I'd yeah. say. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, some of the other ones are pretty inaccurate. Yeah. yeah. And, but it's, it's, I mean, there's a market for everyone. There's like the beginner golfers that just want cheaper yeah. rates, and yeah. they'll, they'll play that all day. Yeah. And then I think companies like Unicor are doing something interesting, going more on the tech-driven side with their whole AI camera piece now yeah um they have one valuable asset which is this freaking trackman app yeah that every player that so comes sick. in here uses so i know one of the biggest challenges with running like an indoor simulator in canada is what do you do in the summer you know like what's what do you have to look forward to uh what did last year's summer look like what are you guys changing for this summer you know uh, i know it's pretty challenging so yeah yeah, I mean, honestly, during the summertime, like, it's hot here. And because the winters are typically so rough, yeah. like, when when golfers have a chance to play outdoors, they want to be outdoors. And I I put JP and I in that same category. Like, if we have the option, <laughs> I'd yeah. rather be out on the course, too. 100%. And so, <laughs> yeah, right? Like, and I think what I found was, like, during the summer, we had a lot of players, especially our members, so the more dedicated members of our community, would come and use this almost as a like a driving range. And so they're still using it for the data. They want to improve their game as they're going outdoors and playing more outdoors. You know, keep in mind here, average round of golf is what a hundred to 150 bucks on the low end. Yeah. And so if you're making that investment coming here and spending half an hour on your game is not the end of the world. Um, so we saw a bit of that, but again, obviously it slows down. I think for us, it's really that we have a core group of our audience that is going to come here no matter what. Yeah. And so we do our best to just then cater, you know, the scheduling, the effort that we put in goes more towards that group. So it's more of a strategic mind shift that we have to have during that time as opposed to, like, it, it's a seasonal business here. So that's just the reality of it. Yeah. Uh, how do you guys feel? Is there anything that you guys want to, you know, let the people know? Like, what's good? Well, honestly, <laughs> like, I, if we can, let's use this as an opportunity to just say thanks to all the members and all the golfers that have come through here. Yeah. Um, honestly, good and bad. We get a lot of feedback on, and it's helped us improve and, and get better. And we want to continue to make this facility the best in Toronto, let alone the country. So, like, yeah. I think for us, it's like it starts with the members, starts with the community. And 
they've driven a lot of what we're doing here and like the improvements we want to do and make are for them and i think that's like i really feel sincere about that like our members have now contributed to actually building out our physical space right like shout out to mike and and drawbox yeah literally like they've put their stamp on our physical space at the front and i think it's cool i think like you know down to the front mat where you see our p logo on a on a winter mat like that came from one of our members yeah and so you know they're really part of our community we hope we're part of theirs and like in a physical space Mm -hmm. and um yeah just shout out to all of them because they keep us motivated to keep keep kind of rolling cool man well said yeah well from a customer standpoint um you know you guys have done a fantastic job it looks amazing um i can't wait for for more locations to open up and i feel like i'm speaking for a lot of people um, so keep up the fucking great work. Um, if anyone sees us in pace, like say what up, these are the, you know, these yeah. are the faces, the familiar faces that you guys are running into every day. So, um, shout out you guys. All right. Cool. 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 And we out.